It is time for Inside Hollywood, uh, one of my favorite times of the week. I'm going to hand it over to Freda and Hawk. Lovely to see you both. Thank you, Jen. Thank you always, Hawk. We're really excited today for Mr. Winkler. Uh, everybody knows him from various things that he's done. I remember him as a dad from my kids' school. So thank you all for being here. And Hawk, once again, have a great interview. Thanks, thanks everybody. And hi to everybody at the Motion Picture and Television Fund and home. Uh, I am so excited to be with Henry today. He's an award-winning actor, director, producer, author of children's books, Hank Zipser series about a dyslexic, chi a dyslexic child uh, and other books, an activist. He does so much work for charity, but that's not all. Henry's reputation, confirmed by all who know him, is that he is the nicest man in town, loyal and genuine, a real mensch. Welcome, Henry Winkler. Come okay, on. wait a minute. I'll start my video. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi I am so happy to be here with you, Hawk. We've known well, each other great. a long time. Great and to I see just, you. In I just want to say transparency. Can I just say hello to all the residents that are watching and uh, what a pleasure that we are uh, together, although through a screen. Yeah. Next year, maybe we, next year, Jerusalem or at the home in Woodland Hills. I was just in Jerusalem a week ago. You were, wow. I was my first time in Israel. Uh, we were in uh, Jerusalem and the old city and it was unbelievable, just something fantastic yeah. uh for all transparency my daughter-in-law uh, annie meyer shire and henry's daughter have been friends i think since before the womb maybe i don't know yes but it's true a and long long time so we adore her immensely we also love your son thank you thank you so i, I talked about being a mensch and i just heard a story that just blew me away. And I wish you'd kind of tell me it. My favorite movie of the year is Coda. Yes. And I just heard that you actually, at when you when Marley Matlin was 12 years old, you kind of discovered her. Can you take us through that? Uh, you know, I got a, a lot of letters because I was doing the Fonz and uh, I was invited to this school in Chicago uh, for the, uh, deaf. And I uh, said, you know what, uh, if I have a moment, why not? Let's go. So Stacy and I, we, well, uh, Gary Marshall uh, had us play softball every Sunday, the Happy Days team. And we traveled all over America playing the major ball fields. So we were in Chicago uh, at Cubs Field, uh, Wrigley Field, and um, I, we went to the school and we watched a talent show. And the kids came out and everything was great. And then all of a sudden, a little girl came out, about 12 years old, and she danced to Steam Heat, I think. And I, I started to cry and Stacy started to cry. And it was not because we were watching a deaf person dance. It was because this person was it. The, the, the energy and the passion and the, I don't, that magic sauce came flying out of this human being. We went backstage to meet her. Her mother said, she wants to be an actress. Please tell her it's too hard. I said, you got the wrong guy. And I walked right up to Marley and I said, Marley, if this is what you want to do, you've got to pursue it. Because what I just witnessed on that stage is like, I don't know, in another stratosphere. Cut to 14. 
She's now in my office at Paramount with her aunt and uncle who lived in Encino. They said, tell Marley, it's too difficult. I said, Marley, if this is what you want, you keep pursuing it. And she liked a pillow a fan sent me on my couch. I said, it's yours. Cut two. I'm reading in Variety that Marley Matlin in Chicago was cast in um, Our Children of a Lesser God. I sent flowers to the theater. Cut to walking across Paramount lot. Now she's trying out for the movie. I said, oh my God, here you are. Give her a hug. Cut to the Academy Awards. She wins. The next day, she's at my door with her Oscar and said, I just left my boyfriend. I, he was abusive. Can I come and stay with you for the weekend? Stacy and I said, of course you can. Come right in. Brought her bags. Brought the Oscar. Two and a half years later, she thinks it's time to move out. And she became our second daughter. Uh, I answered the door for every date. Uh, they were all tall, so I had them change light bulbs because I'm a shorty. And then she's going to get married and gets married on our front lawn. And that, uh, and she, we just texted yesterday because she said, oh, we won another award from the Producers Guild. Oh, this is so exciting. I said, I hope you're enjoying every second. You're now part of two movies that are so awarded. Isn't that amazing in one's career? Yeah. So are you going to the Oscars, Henry, to be with her or are you? Uh, are no, you but I'm sending my spirit. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a great story. And it's, again, something that everybody knows about you. So I love that you told it. Great story. Thank let's, you. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> you grew up in Manhattan. Yes. Your parents were German Jews who had to get out of Germany. Very short German Jews. Very short. Well, so were Sam Goldwyn and Adolf Zucker and a few others. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Uh, but they got out of Germany just before World War II. Yes. And you were born, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're six weeks older than me, Henry. I'm really sorry. No, you're that's okay. Because, and, and I'm going to use that. Uh, respect your elders. Okay. All right. Um, growing up in the... 40s and 50s at the dinner table. Did your family talk about the Holocaust? Did they talk about all that? Was that some, or did they hide it from you? No, they talked about the story of my parents leaving Germany with a visa for six weeks in order to do work in New York City for the company my father worked for, which was buying and selling lumber. Now, I'll tell you what is amazing. All my life, my father had an insignia at the top of his stationery, three tiny pine trees. 1980, Happy Days is going. Stacy and I are invited to Italy. I am given the Italian Emmy. We are staying in a hotel on Lake Como, um, Bellagio. Okay. All of a sudden, my, my wife, uh, Stacy is ill. She's pregnant with our daughter, Zoe. Uh, and I go out and I get salami and cheese and bread, each from their, you know, the, uh, the, the store, and some gelato. I bring it and we find this little ante room in the, uh, uh, in the hotel. And we're having our lunch, a little bread, a little salami, a little cheese. It's delicious. And a woman comes out of her room and said, excuse me, this is part of our room. And we went, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And she's got her number on her arm. And we start talking and I said, oh, where are you from? Uh, Germany. Oh, my father's from Germany. And uh, he worked in the lumber business and he was in the Carpathian Mountains. Oh, 
My father worked in the Carpathian Mountains. No kidding. My father worked for Baron Grödel. Uh, he owned forests from New York to Albany. I mean, from uh, uh, LA to San Francisco, he owned all of the forest. She said, oh, my father is Baron Grödel. I went, no kidding. She said, I haven't met anybody who knew my father for 40 years. I said, all right, let's go. We went down to the lobby. At that time, there were no cell phones. I put her on a payphone with my father in New York. They, they talked. My father had pictures of her father. She left Italy, went to New York, and hooked up with my dad and my, my mom in order to find somebody who knew her parents after the war. The it shared. was 1980. The shared. Unbelievable. Unbelievable story. Wow. That's it. I don't need to interview anymore. Just two stories. That's as good as it gets. It, it, but isn't that wonderful? They mm, moved, this, this woman and her husband uh, uh, left Germany and went to Australia, where they had a uh, redo your kitchen um, uh, company. And they knew no one and never heard of anyone who knew her parents from the end of the war until 1980. It was like Wow. I don't know. It was like wow. out of the sky that um, that we met. We had salami and we offered them some gelato. Always. So let's let's move on. When did you know you wanted to be an actor? When I was seven. Did you what well, did you uh, did you do a show when you were seven? No, I did a show when I was in nursery school, but. <laughs> It, I really remember the passion kicking in at seven and I don't know why. I don't know. I, 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 always, I have always said, if people were born to do something, I was born to try and be an actor. Yeah, and I, here I understand. I, am, I, I was to born Hollywood. to- Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was born to be an organizer. I don't care what it is, I have to organize it. There you go. So I understand. So your parents, did your parents approve of you wanting to be an actor? No, 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 no. My parents wanted me to take over the family business, which was importing and exporting wood. The only wood I was interested in was Hollywood. But my father said, why do you think I bought the business over here? I said, Be besides being chased by the Nazis, dad, was there a bigger reason than that? <laughs> wow. Now, as a kid, did you watch television all the time? Did you go to the movies? Was there? Well, uh, I loved going to the movies. There is, uh, in our neighborhood, the Beacon Theater uh, on the west side of New York, which is now a great concert hall. But I went to the movies and I saw my first movie there uh, starring James Stewart, Rear Window was wow. the first movie I ever saw. Yeah. The first and movie I ever cried in was Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean. Yeah. Who then became the Fonz's idol. You know, I had a, uh, in, my, in my closet, I had a, a, a poster of James Dean. Obviously way before the Fonz. Way before the Fonz. So but as the Fonz, uh, I had a poster in my closet. Did, did you watch TV too? Were there TV shows that you watched? I did, but I am in the bottom 3% academically in America. Yeah. So my parents thought I was stupid. They used to call me Dumme Hund. And for those in the audience who don't speak German, that means dumb dog. My parents were really, really supportive people. Mm. And uh, I was not able to watch television because it was going to take away from my studying. Mm. Little did they know I had dys dyslexia and I wasn't going to get it whether I stayed for an hour and a half or a month and a half. Did, did you, for those who may not know, uh, Henry is still, I mean, is a huge supporter of 
all the charities for dyslexia talks about it all the time. And right. Well, listen, the books that I've written for children, uh, we've written 37 novels with my partner, Lynn Oliver, and most of them are about a little boy who is very resourceful, very funny, and he happens to have dyslexia. Did you know in school, even though you were... You I had, found out at 31. No, but did you know that you were funnier than everybody else in school? Yeah. Well, I depended on humor to get me out of, you know, situations. Uh, if right. I was asked to read out loud in front of the class, I couldn't do it. So I um, used humor and then I was sent to the principal's office. Yes, but, but I mean, you, you got through school, you got through university and you actually were, if you want to tell us about your audition for the Yale School of Drama, which you had to read a, what was it, Shakespeare? I had to do a modern piece and a classical piece. So a modern piece, I did something that I uh, had done uh, in college. And then the, the classical piece, I memorized a monologue from Launce and the Dog. And uh, all, my dogs just heard something in the garden. Um, and I did the audition and I completely forgot the words and I improvised Shakespeare and made up the story of Launce and the dog. And, right and they didn't the even know, did they? They knew, oh. but they took me anyway. <laughs> and uh, did you love uh, being in drama school? I loved it. I loved it because what I wanted to do was I wanted to absolutely get what I was supposed to learn about being an actor and the technique of acting so I would never be a flash in the pan. I didn't want to fizzle out like all these people that I watched when I watched TV. Now, going back to that, when my parents came home from going out to dinner or whatever, they, we, our television had tubes. You know, it was the old television with the record player and the radio in and they would touch the top of the TV. And if it was warm, they knew that I watched when I wasn't supposed to. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, I'll jump ahead for a minute because I want to ask this question. When you became the star that you became, yeah. how did your parents react then, oh. even though they hadn't wanted you to do that? Well, you know what? They were then proud and I didn't care because I didn't need them to be proud when I figured out how to be successful on my own. I needed them to be supportive when I was completely confused by everything, when I felt badly about myself because I wasn't doing well, I wanted to do well, I didn't know how to do well. So they came to the Smithsonian when I presented my leather jacket to the Museum of America and they sat behind me. Now, all of a sudden, they're the co-producers of Henley Winkler. And I have to tell you, I honestly did not care that they were proud of me at that time. And I swore that I would be a different parent when, I, when in a, if I became a family man, if I had children and grandchildren, and I, I was. I listened to them. They were able to say anything that was on their mind. I understood something was off. My stepson, Jed, who is now 50, we had him tested in the third grade and I was 31. And that's when I found out I wasn't stupid I had something with a name. I yeah. was dyslexic. And I, I've heard stories, uh, unbelievable. Annie's told me stories of when they, I guess you had parties or dinners at your house for the kids and you'd stand out front and welcome everybody to your house. And when they left, you'd be out there again, asking them if they had a good time. You were amazingly communicative. And, and I love that everybody was at our house. and. 
um, Annie and Robbie and I and Stacy, my wife, have an unbelievably funny, wonderful uh, relationship. So, you know what I love also? Halloween. Kid, you know, we lived in Toluca Lake when the kids were growing up and it had sidewalks and kids were bust in. And I sat on the doorstep with the children and gave out candy to everybody. I loved every second of it. I do it now at my daughter's house. Adorable. Yeah. So let me ask, you remember- I'm gonna be right back. Don't go away. Okay. I, I'm gonna get Maisie because there's no reason she should be bored. Go ahead. Maisie, get in here. Right I'm, I'm surprised that there weren't dueling dogs. Uh, no, right? because you know why? Sadie, who is a year older than Maisie, um, is well behaved. It's just Maisie uh, who uh, is. I say hi to everybody. He wa he wants Maisie wants to be on television. I think. Yeah, and she's a golden doodle. Yeah, and uh, she's th uh, two and a half, and uh, I just love her to bits. But she uh, just barked enough for today. So I want to ask you a question. I. I posted on Facebook that we were going to have this interview. Yeah. And a cousin of mine wrote me and texted me and said, does Henry remember, remember the day that your father, meaning my father, Howard Koch, and my mother drove you and Stacy in a taxi cab from San Diego? I do. I got the NATO award for performer or newcomer of the year. Your father was a grosser macher. He was the head of um, the studio uh, and there were no planes. And uh, we had no way to get back to LA and I didn't want to stay in San Diego. So we took a cab with no shock absorbers and uh, had the most wonderful time with your parents uh, driving back to LA for the two and a half hours, three hours. And um, my bones were rattled for uh, the next month. But uh, your dad was amazing and uh, just took care of business and got the cab and we were gone and it was wonderful. I remember that uh, w without a doubt. That was a wonderful, um, just uh, Hollywood experience. Now you get the role and you get the role of the Fonz. Yeah within a year or two, you're, it's, it's becoming more and more your show. Yes. How do you keep your ego in check or were you able to at that time? You know, yes, I, I was. And, uh, and I'll tell you, um, one is to uh, uh, have this wonderful family. Uh, you know, um, Jed came into my life uh, in 1977. Uh, I think the, the emotional part of dyslexia, not feeling so great about yourself, being told that you're stupid, uh, then all of a sudden I'm doing what I've dreamt of doing. It's happening on a, on a grand scale. I get 50,000 letters a week. Girls are yelling at me on the street, but here it is. I was no better at math. I wasn't any taller. Nothing about me changed. So I, that helped keep the equilibrium. Being a star doesn't mean you're any better than you were a minute ago. Yeah, any you, smarter you, than you were a minute ago. Yeah, but a lot of people don't know that one, Henry. No, but I, I've watched it happen. I, I've watched the people believe uh, that uh, they now were um, God's gift. And I watched them fizzle into uh, uh, pixie dust. Well, let me ask a question. Does playing the Fonz for all those years change the way you navigate the world? And does playing a cool, confident guy build you up and give you a confidence you may not have had before? While I was doing it, yes. And then after it was over, realizing that first of all, now I'm typecast. And second of all, 
that that kind of confidence is like walking on cotton and it's really terrific until it rains and then the cotton gets soggy and no longer is supportive. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, do you think uh, even before when you became the Fonz, did you as a human being have that inner Fonz in you or did you have to find it? No, I, I, not, I didn't have to find it. I, I, I played everybody I wanted to be. But, uh, you know, uh, I went to temple dances in New York City and there were tough guys, you know, and they would go, what are you looking at? And I would go, actually, I'm not looking at anything. I'm blind. Uh, don't mind me. I'm over here uh, doing the limbo. Uh, you know, uh, I was the non coolest guy in the universe. And I got to play my imagination. And Tom, fantastic. Really? You know, the, of course, you do the, the snap of the fingers, the cool it, the this, the hair, all of that. Once, once the, uh, the snap of the fingers happened and everybody understood, wow, he had a special power, you know, like when you put your hand on the jukebox. Were you guys riffing all the time? Hey, what can the Fonz do now that's that special power? Did you come you know up what? with I, I left that I left that up to the writers. And, uh, you know, my favorite was hitting the side of a an apartment building and all the lights went on in every apartment. I mean, I thought that was great. Lying, uh, you know, going to sleep in the forest. That one's and my the favorite. animals making noise and sitting up and going, a cool it. And then silent so I, the Fonz could sleep. But I have a tip for all your viewers. Okay. Do not snap your fingers at women. They will break them. It only worked on stage 19 on Paramount Lot, um, uh, you know, when I was doing the Fonz. Right. The snapping is not a great idea in real life. By the way, just, just so you know, I got a base hit off you when Happy Days played Marathon Man. <gasps> yeah. uh, out, I think in the valley somewhere. Yes, on Hazeltine. Yes, I, I, I got a base you, hit off of you. To Marathon you know. Man the movie. Okay. <laughs> Marathon Man the movie, yes. I'm on Paramount Lot. <clears throat> Sir Lawrence Olivier is getting into his limousine. I'm running toward him. I said, sir, just give me a second. Yes. I said, my name is Henry Winkler. I am so thrilled to meet you in person because you are the best actor on the planet. Uh, and he said, thank you. Got into his limousine and drove away. That is my marathon man story. Great story. I'll t offline later, I'll tell you some amazing Olivier stories. Oh my from, God. From that movie. Oh my God. Um, that I shook his hand. Yeah. So uh, amongst a bazillion other hit television shows, you're now doing Barry, I guess second or third season. I'm just going to say April, April 24th, 24th, we come back on the air, April 24th, season three. We right. just finished it. Oh okay. my God, I'm so excited. How much has changed doing a series now from back then? From I you thought know. it was funny. Oh, you mean uh, uh, from Barry to Happy Days? Yeah, working. How, what, is, what changed? Right, I will tell you, the technology is different. The actual making of entertainment is exactly the same. You must start with a great writer. If it isn't on the page, it ain't on the stage. The crew is amazing. And they are that they, you know, when the actor is done for the day at like three in the morning, I get in my car and I drive home. The crew has to pack all the wire up, all the, the, the gear up. They have to put it on the truck. They have to drive the truck back to the next location. I'm in my bed. They're still working. Amazing. 
Now, I would do a scene this year and the Dolly Grip, this fabulous woman from, I think, North Carolina, Mary, when I did well, you know, they now have, this is different. It is tape, number one, not the big Mitchell um, uh, movie cameras that we did Happy Days with. Rack over. She has, she has a viewfinder. She can see. And when I did a good job, I could see out of the corner of my eye, she tapped the screen. That's the one. And I thought, okay, all right, I've done a good job. Mary, the dolly grip, has just said, tap, tap, I'm good. Um, now go back to a, a guy I know you loved very much, as did I, uh, Jerry Paris. Uh, and we'll talk about Gary in a minute too. But when did when when the the moment was over on the stage with a live audience, were you able to take a quick look at Jerry to see if he was happy? How did I never he... had to. I never had to because he was always right there, Jerry. We would have killed, we would have thrown ourselves in front of a car for Jerry. Jerry was almost thrown off the lot. He wore a red sweater every Friday night um, to direct the show. Uh, and if he took the microphone to talk to the audience, he would inadvertently insult somebody. It was like a tick. So it was against the law on Paramount lot for Jerry Paris to talk to the audience. <laughs> so he picked up the audience and said, hey, I, where, where are you from? Oh, where are you, Japan, that's, why don't you keep your, dear, your damn cars? Okay, Jerry, we took the phone, the microphone out of his hand, led him away. He didn't mean it, sir. He didn't mean, he loves Toyota. And, uh, but he never, let you down as a director. When I went dry on a moment, when I tried to make it funny and it didn't happen, I turned to Jerry right there, right there. This, he was, he died too soon. I miss him and I miss Gary Marshall. Every, do you remember? Every day. Do you remember? Because I remember at Jerry's memorial service, up on that house, I think uh, Tiger Tail, maybe it was. No, uh, San Remo. San Remo, yeah. where Gary finished and a white dove, when he was finished, which wasn't released by anybody, a white dove flew over all of us, over Gary, and flew out over the Pacific. Yeah. I got the, I remember that so well. Yeah. He, I, I, the, the, there, it, it's, it, you know, there are words that, that, that you, that you, it's indescribable is what I'm trying to say. I, in my career, I worked with Jerry Paris, Gary Marshall. I worked with Adam Sandler. I worked with uh, Mitch Hurwitz. I worked with Michael Shore. I worked with Wes Anderson in, in a movie in France. I worked with Bill Hader and Alec Berg. How lucky is this short Jew who was told you will never make it? Hey, when you see Hater, if you do, I was the producer of a movie called Collateral Damage. I remember Arnold it well. Schwarzenegger, and the Arnold's kind of gopher was Bill Hader. Yeah. But he always knew, Bill always knew, like Ron Howard, they always knew what their ultimate goal was, was to direct. Uh, have you ever played a real person? You mean uh, like a biography? Yeah. I like to think that everybody I play is real. It ah. just, they are written out of somebody's imagination. Okay, well then how do you prepare that backstory, that specific imagery? Well, you know, in drama school, one of the things that we learned to do was to write the left-hand page. Your script is on the right. And then you would always put in loose leaf um, paper in your script, and then you would write the history of your character. You would do research. What, what did he eat? Who were his parents? 
What were his friends like? Uh, where did he go to school? How much education does he have? Uh, and you would work out all these things, even if they were never in the script, but you knew now that this human being was starting to fill out. And all of a sudden he would come out. Now, the Fonz was easier because when I changed my voice in the, in the audition, and that's all I did, I just went from, hi, my name is Henry, I'm from New York City, all right, let me talk to you about this, all right? I'm gonna do this script now. And when I changed my voice, my imagination was opened like a vault. I didn't know what was gonna happen. I had no idea that it was going to allow me to become a tall Italian who was tough as nails and do not mess with me. Amazing. Now you had you had done Lords of Flatbush, which had some of that stuff in it. Yeah, but not really. He was a poet. He was going to go on to college, and yeah. then you know what I what I got to watch was Sly Stallone. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. Who seemed like a big beefy tough guy, who was unbelievable or is because he's not dead, is very funny, a prolific writer. Yeah very thoughtful and uh, an amazing human being uh, who was totally um, uh, like a, uh, um, a puzzle, you know, because you saw what you saw. And then if you delved a little deeper, this amazing person was inside. Never judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Did you... Uh... Now you talked about the, the great directors that you loved working with and actors. When did you decide or did you always know you wanted to produce and direct? Okay, never did. That was a time filler, writing all these books, a time <clears throat> filler. I couldn't get hired after the fun. Everybody said, oh, so funny, such a great guy. Oh, we like being with him, good actor, but he was the Fonz. So for 10 years, I really couldn't get acting jobs. So Skip Brittenham III, my lawyer, said, I'm going to um, start a company for you. I said, you can't do that. I know nothing about it. He said, you'll learn. And I had different partners. And then uh, uh, John Rich came into my life, a very idiosyncratic human being. But the first show I produced was MacGyver. And then Sightings, which ran for seven years. And then uh, on the Disney Channel, uh, uh, a wonderful show we did up in, um, uh, up in uh, Vancouver uh, for three or four years. Game shows, uh, it, it just it was amazing. But I never thought about it, never thought I could do it. So I tell every child I meet, you have no idea how powerful you are or what you can accomplish until you try. My favorite thing to do, fly fishing for trout. You can't catch a fish unless your fly is in the water. I understand you're also a hell of a dancer. Uh, I, well, I dance now from my waist up. I used to be, I could do the Kazatsky, I could do the limbo. I won dance contests and then I became 76 and now I negotiate with my knees to get out of bed. I say, okay guys, it's time, gotta feed the dogs. Who's gonna be first, left or right, huh? All right, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Is there an actor or director that you really wanna work with that you haven't yet? I would like to act with Meryl Streep. I would like to act with Ryan Gosling. I would like to be directed by Quentin Tarantino. I would You'd like, like to get blood all over you. Yeah, well, I would like to work until I can't anymore. And when I was just in Israel, in Tel Aviv, I had a two hour lunch with Quentin Tarantino, 
How random is that? Fantastic. He lives in Tel Aviv with his beautiful wife. They're expecting their second child. And uh, I said to him, the greatest sound in cinema to me was when Brad um, went at the end of the film to his dog who jumped off the couch and saved the day. Greatest thing I ever saw. I love that movie. Yeah. Uh, Brad Pitt. Now that's my wife met Brad Pitt at the last time we went to the um, SAG Awards. And I said to Brad Pitt, everything that people say to me, just stay right there. Just don't move. I'm going to get my wife. I swear to God. And I said, Brad, don't, don't move, please. Let me just introduce you to my wife. And Stacy came over and he was so gracious. And they ha- and I have a picture. Oh my God. It was like, I don't know. It was amazing. When you were, when you were growing up, let's go way back now. Yeah. Was there, was there an actor or an actress that you, oh my God, you were so in love with or you thought was phenomenal? Spencer and then you Tracy. got to meet them. What was that first meeting like? Uh, I'll tell you what. I never met Spencer Tracy, but I was in awe of the reality. He, he kept this reality that he was never a false beat. James Stewart. So now I go with Ron Howard to the very first People's Choice Awards. Hmm. And I'm sitting next to James Stewart. And across the table is Robert Mitchum. And James Stewart's talking to me. He's, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you just tell me who who is that? I, I don't remember. And I now am telling him the guest list of people walking in. His wife, I think her name was Dorothy or Dolores? I don't remember. I don't remember either, but I got to Mrs. Stewart wants to fix me up with their daughter. And it was, I don't know, and I was in heaven. Then across the, 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 um, uh, Robert Mitchum had so much to drink. I know that he was speaking English. I know the words he was speaking, but not one of them were connected to the others. It was amazing, the great Robert Mitchum. And then Betty Davis called me up and said, I'd like to take you to dinner. And so she came to my house. We went out for a French dinner, Betty Davis, my wife and I. Betty Davis smoked in my house. And I kept running around with an ashtray because she would just (laughs) anywhere. And I didn't care. All the rug, the sofa, she would just, and oh my God, it was amazing. James Cagney, I wish I met James Cagney. That, I wish I was, um, uh, met him, yeah. But it, it, uh, it just, uh, George Burns called me kid. I mean, he called everybody kid, but he called me kid. Yeah, it, it is. It is something when you get to meet. I was lucky enough to work with both Mitchum and Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, as, as, as early on. So. Oh my gosh, I yeah. that was really thrilling. Is the, is there a topic Come uh, that you'd like to be part of making uh, for film or television? Is there something that you've thought about? God, I'd really like to get involved with. You know what I would like to do? I would like to play a mute. I would like to see if I could sustain a character who absolutely did not speak with just, excuse me, my mind and my body. My son who directed me, Max, who directed me uh, in the audition for uh, Barry, which starts again on April 24th on HBO, uh, has a project. And I think it's the first time that he said, if we sell this project, you're going to be in it. Oh, my God, my son is going to direct me if we sell this project. That's I'm terrific. so excited. That's I that's like terrific. incense every night. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, it's when I have to have a deal made, I call my son, Robbie, 
to to do the contract. Great lawyer, a great lawyer. I've uh, I, I've talked to him um, about his career from law school on. Yeah, what My a favorite. wonderful, wonderful young man he is. Yeah. My favorite. Not that this has anything to do with you, but I was on the red carpet with. Uh, God, I can't remember her name, of course. Hey, Never George mind, Club. I don't know the story. Um, does it make any difference to you whether you're, I realize streaming has changed things, but does it make any difference to you in, in the way you act if you're gonna be on the small screen or on the big screen? No, I think that um, I, in the way that I have defined cool, uh, being cool is being authentic. And the key, and it took me quite a while to get here, but the key to acting is being authentic. If you're on the big screen, the small screen, if you're on radio, if you're on the stage, uh, you know, if you're doing street art, I've done it all. The more authentic you are, the more magnetic you are. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give? <laughs> A young actor. What would I say? Okay, this is what I would say to a young actor or actress. Um, first of all, be honest about your talent. Have a burning that does not go away in your soul because it is difficult, but you cannot see the, the difficulty. You can only see the journey. Prepare your talent. Make sure you train your talent. And then you absorb, you take a pill of tenacity and gratitude and go for what you want. That would be my, um, and, oh, is it all right if I say a bad word? Sure. Okay. Get an extra pillow. Buy an extra pillow because you're going to be rejected so often and you're going to think, but I did such a great audition. I was so good. What? And it has nothing to do with you. You just go home and take all that anger, take your new pillow, your extra pillow and beat the shit out of your bed so that you drain your anger. So the next time you go, you are an empty vessel. Good for you, Henry. I love it. And also know that even if you do the greatest audition, you have to get lucky. Yeah, Luck has absolutely, lot to do. absolutely. And you know what? Uh, you know, people say, well, um, did you deserve that? Uh, did you, uh, you know, um, they, they got it, not you. It, when you're supposed to have something, it comes to you. You know, if you do the work and you really improve and you're really um, your professional self, it will come to you. Uh, Jen Clymer, our director, has a question yeah. from somebody in the audience. Jen? Yes. Um, our, the understanding is your family is very charitable, not just the, um, the charities that you support with dyslexia yes. and how incredible you and Stacy have been with MPTF, but your daughter was also um, part of a, a charitable mission. It was an amazing thing. Zoe is a great feisty girl, very, very good friends uh, with Hawk's um, son and daughter-in-law. And she watched her mother uh, Stacy worked with abused, abandoned, and uh, neglected children and started um, uh, in the 80s, started the Department of Children's Services with her friend Nancy. And Zoe watched it. And now Zoe is a kid and she's growing up and she goes to the clubs and she, everybody knows her. She's like the mayor of, um, you know, of our neighborhood of, of uh, high school and a uh, college. Um, and she gets married to Rob, Rob Rhinus. She, uh, they have three sons, uh, 10, uh, five and three. 
watches the news and realizes, oh my God, all of those children on the border that are being caged could be my son. And out of, she jumped out of her chair and with two other friends started, this is about humanity. That's what it's called. This is about humanity. They have raised $2 million, even through the pandemic. There is no overhead. She then uh, recruits people, gets on a bus, goes down to the border, sees what is needed by the individual child, then goes and uses the money to get what that child needs, takes care of business and does that every month. Took a family that immigrated, were allowed into America, got them an apartment, got them a job. All of a sudden in our front uh, hallway were suitcases given by all these people that Zoe had met, filled to the brim with clothes for an eight-year-old girl, a 10-year-old girl, a 12-year-old girl, and mom. Mm -hmm. she, feed them, she fed them, clothed them, housed them. They, uh, I believe mom has a job now and they are on their way to being uh, wonderful, um, giving citizens of this great country. Wow, what a story. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Jen is wearing a leather jacket in your <laughs> And let me tell you something, Jen, you are my kind of girl because you really, you sport that leather really great. Uh, <laughs> Thank this you. Is, this has been, uh, this has been really terrific, Henry. I've loved every minute of it. Your stories are great. Thank um, you. Jen I, has I, I really enjoyed being here. And it's good that it's over because Jen and I are going to get a mall right now. Well, Jen right. has a couple. Uh, Bob, uh, Jen has her usual questions. Bob, right. did you want to say something first? Bob, just want to thank Henry for joining us, for engaging in a great conversation for the last hour with our our man hawk the man on the street the interviewer uh and tell you how much we appreciate it how much all of us at mptf resident staff love you love your work appreciate can everything I, can i just say everything you do for the community can i just say that i love that you exist that that place in the world in our community exists i think about it all the time because there are people there for whatever reason you're there to receive them they have a place that is an amazing thing so it is my honor to be here today with all of you thank you to chat i re i'm not kidding thank you so much thank you um I do have a couple of questions. Yeah, you're not we... going to get away, Henry, without answering Jen's questions. Okay, yes. Jenny. So this is our 336th episode of Creative Chaos. I'm which... very tired. <laughs> um, it's you were, Henry, you were 337 on our list, but someone dropped out, so we got to you today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we ask every guest who comes on, these two very important questions because okay. we, we are the motion picture and television fund. Yes. So what is your favorite film and what is your favorite television series? Of course, with the exception of Barry, which comes out on HBO April 24th. Right. What do I watch now? Do you know that during the pandemic, we watched a tremendous amount of TV and uh, we found that the South Korean series were incredible. And I will give you two. One on Netflix is called, and I, I shouldn't do this because I'm on HBO, is called Vincenzo. This is the log line. He was born in South Korea. He was raised in Italy. He was bred by the mafia. Ooh. And he is the greatest hero. <laughs> I'm telling you, Vincenzo from South Korea. The second one, crash landed into you. I'm telling you that 
I fell into a show hole when it was over. Crash landed into you. A young, successful woman goes uh, gliding, uh, parachute gliding, and somehow uh, uh, lands up in North Korea and the adventure ensues. Mm. It will just, it is adventure, romance, comedy, and now American television, Yellowstone, we binged four seasons, and then 1883. Also by the same writer, producer, uh, Taylor Sheridan, I wrote him a fan letter. Amazing. Movie. Movie. And it, it can be current or of all time, like favorite film. Oh, gosh. You know, I never have a favorite because I have so many. Like, I love The Magnificent Seven. I cried. The first time I ever cried was um, uh, Rebel Without a Cause. I loved um, Great Escape. Uh, City of God, about the gangs in uh, Rio. In Rio. Rio. Oh, but watch it in the morning. Do not watch it at night. You need it like a day to get over it. Uh, I, I love going to the movie. Oh, King Richard, I think that Will Smith should win the award, hands down. Unbelievable movie. Unbelievable performance by everybody in that movie. Oh, and Coda with my darling Marley Matlin. The family is deaf. One of the daughters hears and is the translator for the family. She is torn to bits because it's time for her to fly and the family tries to hold on to her. Coda. Henry, this has been an amazing pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this, buddy. Um, see, see you with the kids. You know what? Absolutely. I look forward to it. And thank you for this invitation. Take care. Thank buddy. you, Henry. See you.